23rd of January 2012. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. Game in the background is once again Dark Messiah. Oh, I love this game. There are some parts of it that are extremely frustrating that you'll probably see in the next few episodes, in fact, exactly what's so frustrating. That rooftop chase sequence is infuriating. Oh, God. Do not put jumping puzzles in a game where your movement is that clumsy. And don't get me wrong, I'm okay with the slow, weighty movement, as long as you don't force me to do jumping puzzles with it. Oh. Anyway. First email comes in right here from Ilya that says, I was playing Skyrim earlier and I realized how much better the game would be if it featured a co-op mode. Not just the Elder Scrolls series, but the Fallout series as well. Don't you think it would improve the gameplay if there was a co-op mode where you can play through the game with a friend? I don't understand why Bethesda doesn't have this feature already, considering how obvious I think it would be. I'd love to have your feedback, and is there a reason that you think Bethesda hasn't made a co-op feature for Fallout and Elder Scrolls? I'm trying to figure that one out myself, actually. At this point, it seems ridiculous that it's not in the game. If I'm totally honest, I think that Elder Scrolls is one of those games, in fact, one of the RPGs that should work the best with a co-op mode. And the rationale that I put behind that is simply because Elder Scrolls is more about exploration than it is about storytelling and narrative. I.e. the storytelling and narrative in that game is actually the weakest bit. Did anyone really care about the main storyline of Oblivion? Not especially, no. Most people just want to explore cool stuff, and exploring cool stuff with friends is even better. Being able to roam around as a party would be absolutely fantastic, and then have the world scale up as you so desire. Hell, you can then go one better and decide to maybe put in a system whereby you can take over towns, and there's just so many cool potential ideas that could be put in there, but Bethesda doesn't seem to want to do it. Now, maybe it's a lack of multiplayer experience from Bethesda that's actually keeping them away from it. Maybe they're shying away from that particular idea as a direct result of that. If we look at the development history of Bethesda Softworks, it just isn't there. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, Bethesda has never released an online multiplayer game. I'm looking through what they've done and I'm not seeing a damn thing. Obviously, they put out Fallout, they put out Oblivion. Needless to say, they made all the Elder Scrolls games before that, but in reality, Bethesda hasn't made much beyond that. They're mostly a publisher. Games like, say, Wet, for instance, Rogue Warrior, Brink, Hunt of the Demon's Forge, Rage, even going back as far as Star Trek Legacy, Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. This is all stuff that's been published by them. It's not actually developed by them. I mean, digging back through their history to see if I could find a single example of a multiplayer game developed by Bethesda. The only one that I could find that even had the possibility of that seemed to be IHRA Drag Racing, which also did not have an online multiplayer mode as far as I'm aware. In fact, the multiplayer mode of this game was actually on a cell phone, a wireless device released in 2003, which was designed to run on the N-Gage, if I recall correctly. Yeah, not good. So their only experience in multiplayer is via the end gauge. Yeah, I don't think that really applies to the modern multiplayer setup, really. It is a really logical thing to do. As I said, I've seen multiplayer modes pop up in games that make less sense. I think Mass Effect 3 is a prime example of this. Why is there multiplayer coming up in that? Nobody knows. But why is there no multiplayer in this? I just have to assume that Bethesda has an aversion to multiplayer. I can't think of any other reason for it, because... I don't think they're deluded in believing that the game is a narrative experience. It's an exploration experience. It's an immersion experience. We don't really care about the narrative. In fact, the narrative is often particularly bad, and the dialogue in Elder Scrolls games has a tendency of being awkward. I, every Elder Scrolls game that I've seen that has voice acting in it has had plenty of really awkward lines. And of course, some of them end up spawning massive internet memes. It's pretty bad. As far as I'm concerned, that should be a priority. Hell, release it as an expansion or a DLC. There are already modders trying to do it. I believe they tried to pull it off for Oblivion. Pretty sure they didn't manage it. Multi-TES4, if I recall correctly, is the name of it. I think there was one more, Oblivion Online. Neither of those really worked all that well. It seems like Bethesda could probably call upon the expertise of people like id. Perhaps they would be able to assist in it. I don't think it breaks the story, honestly. It's a case of rather than have the Dover Keen, you've got the Dover Twins. I mean, I don't see why not. You could have multiple Dover Keen. It don't, doesn't really break the law. You can just say, hey, it's a, there were twins, triplets, quadruplets, whatever the hell. 
it, it doesn't really matter. I, I do feel that that should be added in. I would love to share the experience of Elder Scrolls with another person, and I feel that that's something they should be looking into quite seriously in the future, perhaps with DLC, but it's definitely one of those games that makes sense to have a co-op mode in it of some description. I'm just trying to think through all of the various parts of the game. It's like, what wouldn't work with multiplayer? And I'm not coming up with many examples of mechanics and systems within that game that wouldn't work on a multiplayer level. If they can pull it off with the Old Republic, then I'm pretty sure they can pull it off with Elder Scrolls, which is even less story-orientated and even less dialogue-orientated. This one comes in from the Kodu that says this. On a previous mailbox, you said about new IP not getting a fair crack at selling due to the consumer tending to go after franchises they know and familiar characters. So my question for you is, what is your take on new IP being packaged or sold with franchise games? It may sound stupid, but there are very few companies actually doing this that I know of. The general idea is they sell you one of their big budget games with a cut down length of another game or another game that is comparatively smaller. Best example being the console and PC version of the Orange Box, which I did buy and release for £25. And on there, as you know, was Half-Life 2, the Half-Life 2 Episodes 1 and 2, and Team Fortress 2, which for the most part was a risk, as the original Team Fortress was, as you know, a more military and less cartoon-like shooter, so it was trying a new look for an old IP. Then there was Portal, which upon initial release, I did hear friends of mine asking what the hell it was and saying they probably wouldn't play it. But as it was with Half-Life 2, they might end up trying it. But looking back, it's possible to see how much Portal exploded from that point, even getting its own individual releases and getting a full release sequel. Valve did go on record and say that Portal was a risk and they put Portal out on the orange box essentially to gauge the public reaction to the game by only releasing a version much shorter than a full retail release because they were unsure as to how it would work. Another sort of example is the immense sales that Crackdown received on the 360 due to the inclusion of the Halo 3 beta. My question is two parts. Should more companies start adding new IP concepts in with existing franchise releases as essentially an extra little game to play on too? Or should new IP receive its own release and have to be shown on its own merit without companies having to spend extra money, and in the case of consoles, extra disk space on something that's not actually the franchise people are buying? The orange box is a really good example of this working out, as I think you've very accurately explained there. It's funny that you should even mention the TF2 as a risk, actually. I think that people don't really realize that, but the original TF2, and I actually have the old PC gamer that showed off a bunch of screenshots from this, was very much a much more realistic looking game. It was militarized. There was a tank in that thing. <laughs> you know, it looked like Team Fortress 2 was going to be a pseudo-realistic military shooter of sorts. It didn't end up that way, of course. It went down the characterized cartoony route, and that certainly paid massive dividends, huge dividends, and has resulted in the game being extremely distinctive in today's market, and it's most likely contributed significantly to its success. But yes, Portal. Portal was that little add-on game, the little tack-on game. And honestly, Portal ended up being the thing that people hyped the most. TF2 has obviously had a lot more longevity, but TF2 has not spawned a fully-fledged commercial sequel on all consoles. And more to the point, TF2 has not done well outside of the PC. It is not played all that much on the 360 or the PS3. Portal, on the other hand, created a massive new brand The turned into a fully-fledged sequel, as you have pointed out, as well as started innumerable, innumerable insufferable memes. I am very surprised that we don't see more of this, incredibly surprised, because it seems to make an awful lot of sense. The crackdown option that you mentioned earlier is also something that I curiously haven't seen an awful lot of. If I recall correctly, Bulletstorm's Epic Edition gave early access to the Gears 3 beta. Aside from that though, not all that many games actually spring to mind as having done that, and I am very surprised by that. I would think that more of that kind of stuff would happen. It was successful for Crackdown, certainly. It's just a shame that Crackdown 2 was kind of a bad game, but the original Crackdown did sell enough copies to justify a sequel, and that was a piece of original IP. As far as I'm concerned, they should try doing that with pretty much every piece of original IP. I think that original IP needs every piece of help it can possibly get, and you might as well exploit the value of franchises in order to promote new IP. Take something that some people consider to be an evil within the industry and turn it into a positive. And more to the point, as you just mentioned with Portal, the thing about Portal is that a lot of people said the Portal was just the right length. In fact, if you remember Yahtzee, 
in one of his rare moments of benevolence, he praised the length of Portal, saying, you know, Portal was pretty much perfect. The length was perfect. It didn't outstay its welcome. You know, I would actually like more games like that, especially I don't have a lot of time. Yeah? And also a lot of adults, which is, of course, becoming more and more the primary demographic for gaming. In fact, in some countries it already is. Adults want potentially shorter game experiences that they don't pay so much for. I would be totally happy playing a game that was just a three-hour campaign with maybe some kind of replayability in terms of a challenge mode or whatever. I'd be totally fine with that because as long as I'm not paying full price, I can have a nice, cool experience that I can play through in an evening and then not have to touch again and say, you know what, that was fun. I enjoyed my evening with this game. Moving on. What's wrong with that? It's a perfect test bed as well to put new IP out there and say, hey guys, is this something that interests you? And if it does well, and if it gets a lot of positive response, then on the back of that, you can actually produce the sequel. That's the real challenge with original IP, getting to the point where a sequel is actually viable without having to pump a ton of money into it. I think we're quite fortunate, for instance, that Dead Space ended up with a sequel, considering that Dead Space did not do amazingly well. It obviously did well enough, and I think EA had enough faith in the franchise and their marketing machine to believe that they could make Dead Space 2 actually sell, and it seems like they succeeded in that regard. But we could have very well seen Dead Space go down the route of Mirror's Edge, which has not had a sequel and did not sell all that well, and plenty of other IP, as I've pointed out, stuff like Enslaved Odyssey to the West, which I think was amazing for a third-person platform. I think it was fantastic and sold less than a million copies, which is apparently not enough to greenlight a sequel there. Yeah, more of that, please. Please, by all means, bundle these things together. It, it's one of two things you can really do at the moment, and full-priced original IP is the difficult one. That's the most difficult thing to do, because you can release original IP without too much risk by putting it at a lower price point and building what is effectively an Xbox Live Arcade game. We're talking like the 10 to $15 price point range. That is a really good place to put out new IP, and as a result, we see a ton of new IP coming from either indies or indeed coming from major developers. Stuff like Double Fine, for instance, has put out a bunch of games in the 10 to $15 range, so Stuff like Trenched, Costume Quest, Stacking, and they've all done reasonably well at that price point. But I think the holy grail is to be able to put out kind of a concept piece, as it were, something that's a bit bite-sized, like Portal, and then have it gain enough marketing momentum and gain enough brand recognition by its inclusion with another title or some kind of compilation to actually get that full priced release. Can you do that with the current download model? That's questionable. I don't really know. What kind of factors do you as a player use to judge a game that's come out on Xbox Live Arcade or Steam for about 10 to 15 bucks? What do you view as acceptable at that price point and what do you not view as acceptable at that price point? Because I have a feeling that people will accept things like no multiplayer or accept things like not having AAA production values and graphics, but they won't necessarily accept the game being short. I think the length of the game for people is a massive deal. And as regards to what people view as good value and what they don't, that's going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis. If I pay $60 for a game and the campaign's four hours, I will generally feel like the campaign was a waste of my time. I don't think that is good value. $15 an hour? No, not good value. If it's about eight or nine hours and I paid $60 for it, if it's a really good campaign, okay. And if it's got some replayability, some reasons to actually go through it again, yeah, sure, absolutely. If it's got multiplayer, you can throw all that stuff out the window because as long as the multiplayer is good enough, I couldn't care less if the campaign is short. And indeed, with stuff like Call of Duty, I've just avoided it completely since the original Modern Warfare because beyond that point, the campaign's just got incredibly bad. I'll just say, hey, install the multiplayer and just play that if I want to actually enjoy the game. But... At a 10 to $15 price point, would you accept a three-hour campaign? Yes, no, possibly. That's going to come down to the individual. But I feel that if Portal was released at 10 to $15 on its own, initially, without the big brand recognition that followed it up after its release with the Orange Box, let's just say that it wasn't part of the Orange Box, they released it on its own, would it have got anywhere? And more to the point... If it had, would it have just got anywhere because Valve has a really good reputation? 
could EA, for instance, have gotten away with Portal? Could Activision have gotten away with Portal? I think that some people vastly underestimate what brand loyalty can do. I think if you ever see anyone talking rapidly about Steam, you can understand the kind of brand loyalty that Valve has cultivated, and for the most part, they deserve it. And uh, honestly, Valve are one of the better guys in the industry. I don't view them as the heroes, certainly. I don't view anybody, really, as the heroes. I think that they've all got their own motivations, which are sometimes questionable, and there's a lot of things that I don't like about Steam, but they're pretty much one of the good guys relative to everybody else. Would Activision or Ubisoft or EA have gotten away with Portal at 10 to $15 price point? I don't think so. I have my doubts, honestly. So can you sell a game that is only three to four hours at 10 to $15? There aren't all that many examples that I personally can come up with. Bastion probably qualifies, but then again, that's actually longer than three to four hours. That's more like six to eight-ish. Shank is another example. You might think, that's an indie game. Well, actually, that was published through the EA Partners program, so that would work. Shadow Complex and perhaps Renegade Ops as well. Those are examples. And those are original IP. You can talk about other things like, say, Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty. That was pretty short, but that's not an original IP. That's a franchise title. But here is the problem with all of those examples, ladies and gentlemen. Do you see a full-length quote-unquote sequel coming out of any of those games? No. No, you do not. Shank 2 is on its way out, but that's not going to be a $60 game. That's not going to be a full-length title. It's probably going to be about the same length as what we saw before. It's awkward, isn't it? I asked my Twitter followers about this, and they couldn't think of anything. A lot of these games don't really lead into the idea of a full-scale commercial sequel. Portal is one of the only ones where that's been done. Three-hour game, around $10 to $15 price point. I mean, at the minute, it's about $10, if I recall correctly, once it was released on its own. And then you think, huh, right. You can expand that to a full-priced release by adding this length and these features but good luck doing it with any of the other games that I just released. It's an interesting point. It's a very unexplored part of the market. Not only the idea of bundling a short form, but triple A quality of game in the form of an original IP in with another game, but also actually selling something like that on its own. Things like Renegade Ops, they're not really triple A. I mean, we're talking about, it's a top down isometric shooter. Stuff like Shank is a side scrolling brawler. Those are not the kind of games that you're going to see this full-priced sequel release out of. You know, what I'd like to see is an FPS, a AAA-looking FPS, with a three-hour campaign, maybe even no multiplayer whatsoever, maybe a bit of replayability, some kind of challenge mode, just released, either bundled with a game or at a $10 to $15 price point. Because I would be okay buying that, and if enough people then bought that, assuming that, of course, it was an FPS with enough interesting and unique concepts, then you can greenlight a full-length sequel to this thing. Why is that so unexplored? That is probably one of the best points I've heard in ages, honestly. So thank you for that email. It's a fantastic point, and it's really got me thinking. And I have to wonder when we're going to start seeing that kind of stuff and when the distinction between the Xbox Live Arcade style of game and the AAA is actually going to disappear and these things are going to meld and merge just a little bit more in the style of what we saw with, say, Portal. Okay, folks, that has been done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox, and I'll see you next time.